Uh, all right. It's 11. I think we can slightly start. Uh, before we kick off, I would like to ask all of you, if possible, to open your camp so that this would, I suppose, trigger further actions, discussions, and debates. Uh, my name is Ebu Bekir Ushuk. Uh, I am the head of uh, Brussels Office of Vocal Europe. Uh, and before we kick off, I would like to also briefly mention about who Vocal Europe is and what we do. Uh, Vocal Europe is a Brussels-based think tank dedicated to research and communication on EU foreign policy. Uh, migration uh, as such is also an important factor uh, shaping the EU foreign policy. Therefore, it's quite important for us to, 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 to work on this matter. Um, today we are meeting for a project named Thesis, Antithesis and Synthesis Migration Lab, which is a multi-stakeholder uh, project funded by Europe for Citizen Program of the European Union. And the main idea of the project is to understand and combat the stigmatization of the migrants and minority groups in our societies. Uh, to do this, understandably, uh, we would like to encourage uh, participation of young people, just like you and I, uh, for such debates and, and gatherings. And during this project, uh, we will have five interactive workshops designed for uh, young people. Uh, normally, these workshops were planned to be face-to-face, -face, but unfortunately, uh, because of the challenges posed by coronavirus, we have to conduct these uh, gatherings and workshops online. Uh, in fact, we did organize uh, the first workshop back in May 2020, and this is the second one. Uh, and in each workshop, uh, we are focusing on a specific matter with respect to uh, migration. Uh, and today, we will uh, analyze the specific situation of uh, refugees and migrants, uh, address their pathways, uh, particularly to labor market integration, and discuss uh, the role of the agency in resettlement process of the refugees. Uh, and for that, uh, we have two excellent presentations today. Uh, the first one will be delivered by Hannah Schneider. Uh, Hannah Schneider is an associate PhD researcher uh, in the migration, diversity, and justice cluster and affiliated to the Department of Political Science at VUB, which is a free University of Brussels here in Brussels. So, uh, and her PhD project uh, focuses on refugee resettlement and explore uh, the agency of the refugees within the resettlement process. Uh, the second presentation, however, will be delivered by uh, Eleonora Lamia, Lamio, sorry for that. Uh, she works as a project manager at uh, This Is Network. Her expertise covers uh, issues including social economy, entrepreneurship, uh, social inclusion, social innovation, ICP rights, uh, social dialogue, and migration. And uh, following these two presentations, uh, Katia Lopez, our project partner from Portugal, will have a short uh, intervention to comment on the issues uh, from a Portuguese context. Uh, that all being said, uh, I really would like to encourage all of you uh, to interact and share your opinions, questions uh, about the presentations. Uh, but uh, last but not least, I would like to remind you that uh, all the participants will receive a certificate of attendance uh, once the workshop is over. So that being said, I would like to just uh, give the floor to our first speaker, Hannah Schneider. Hannah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll try to share my screen with you um, to see my presentation. Um, Give me just one second to do that, because <laughs> sure, I've never- take your time, that. take your time. Um, yeah, it should work. Okay. Yes, we can see that. You can see my screen and you should be able to see the presentation titled The Role of Refugees Agency in the Resettlement Process, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. First, first thing <laughs> already um, succeeded. Um, so yeah, thank you very much also for the um, introduction. Basically that covered 
covered my stuff. So as you can see, um, basically the title of my presentation is also my uh, PhD project. So I could talk about these issues for ages, but I'll try to, to make do with uh, 20 minutes. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, I don't see the comment section as it is now, but I guess if... Uh, someone... Yes, there is, sorry for interruption, there is a section, chat section, so if you have any question, you might just pose your question there and, and we will put it to the speaker. Yeah, exactly. So if you have anything, just type. I might not get through it uh, just within the second, but uh, eventually I hope to, to answer your questions. Um, and I would also have some questions for you, so, so when and uh, you can just type them into the comment sections as well, please. Um, and so what I would like to do in this, well, 20 minutes, a bit, bit less, is basically first to just have a really short look again at the definition of refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants, because there's always a lot of confusion around those. Um, so we'll just cover that shortly, and then we'll dive into the resettlement process um, and see how it actually works, how people actually get into the resettlement process, and uh, lastly, and most importantly for our topic today, um, also what are kind of the general expectations, hopes many refugees have for the resettlement, uh, for their resettlement in a new country, but also what might be the reasons why they actually uh, don't want to be resettled. Um, but so before we go into, in, in, into the resettlement per se, um, I would already have a short question for you. Um, so in your own kind of experiences, what, what you pick up wherever, um, what is your idea of a refugee and your idea of an asylum seeker? It doesn't have to be like a full-fledged legal definition or whatsoever, but if you have any inkling um, who those two definitions or two categories might be, um, just happy to, to receive any ideas, write them in the comment sections, give you like a minute or two, and then we'll go from there. And I also try to find the comment section in this kind of overview. And uh, with your wow. permission, if there is anybody who would like to comment on it uh, orally, he or she is more than welcome. Yeah. Yeah, already a great quote. Yeah, what I forgot to say, please just don't Google it <laughs> because it's kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> so anything that uh, is already in your mind. Um, but that's a great comment. May I add? Yeah. All reason. Okay. Uh, so for me, I think it is a, the traditionally known thing that uh, refugees or the asylum seekers who have the who who went through the process and uh, their trade have been approved by the government or by the UNHCR. So, for example, here in Belgium, <coughs> you do the process of uh, asking for asylum. For the moment that you are under the uh, under that procedure, you're an asylum seeker, and as soon as you have a positive decision, then you are a refugee. Wow, perfect. <laughs> That's kind of exactly the definition. <laughs> Thank Wonderful. Thank you. Wow. In my last uh, group, it was much more difficult than that. <laughs> so yeah, that's just, uh, and also anything in the comment section, perfect. Uh, exactly, exactly on the spot. Um, so again, if, but also if you, if you struggled with any of those definitions, don't worry because it's, it's a very blurred distinction. Also, if you look at media, if you look at, um, uh, newspapers, 
politicians, speeches, very often people use different, uh, different words or the same words for very different meanings. Many, many times, I don't think it's because I don't know, but because they have a specific agenda, especially politicians. But so all in all, uh, if, if that's something not really clear, uh, don't worry, that's most cases uh, for most people. Um, so starting with the definition of refugees, um, the definition comes from the 1951 Refugee Convention, also the Geneva Convention, which is kind of the cornerstone of international refugee law. And here it says uh, the definition of refugee is very clear and it is only for five specific reasons. So a refugee is a person who is fearing persecution because of five very specific reasons. Uh, first one being either race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. These are the five reasons that you fear persecution. And second of all, and it's also a very important point, you have to be outside of your own country of nationality because you're basically fleeing your own government, right? Mostly. And so obviously you can't, your government doesn't help, help you. Um, and to be able, I think somebody is not muted if you could just, just talk through it no matter what. I think somebody is talking, but I cannot detect who is he or she. On the screen, but I'll just talk to it anyway. Uh, is it is it Fatih or Mr. Yilmaz are talking? Could you? Could you, could you hello. Um, I can mute people. That okay, I did. I did it. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, Go. Perfect. Thanks. Um, so yeah, so you have to be outside of your own country uh, to be able to receive protection, international protection, right? So these are the, that's the definition of a refugee. So there are very specific reasons, for example, fleeing from natural disaster, if you, if your village is flooded or something, that's not a reason to receive refugee protection at the moment, yeah? It's just something to keep in mind generally. Um, whereas, which was already uh, perfectly pointed, uh, uh, pointed out, an asylum seeker is still in the process. Uh, if you're an asylum seeker, you did not receive refugee status. So you're basically asylum seekers from the point where you cross the border to a different country, uh, you ask for protection, uh, but, you fi but your file has not, or your case has not, has not been decided upon. So you're still in the stage um, to see if you will actually receive protection or not. In the case you receive protection, you are, you are entitled to stay in the country, you have some rights. Uh, if, you, if you don't receive protection, um, then you will need to be returned to your own country if that's possible or somebody else, but you, you, you're not legally in the country afterwards anymore. Yeah, if that's still unclear, just write it in, into the comments. Um, so, and then the migrant is just a really broad term for anybody who lives outside of his own country. For example, I'm German, I live in, in Belgium at the moment, so I am a migrant. Many of you might also be migrants. Uh, you could also be a migrant and a refugee, uh, or a migrant and uh, an asylum seeker, obviously, but you can't be a refugee and an asylum seeker at the same time. Um, so, these are kind of the definitions uh, and very importantly today, or at least in this workshop, in my presentation, we're only talking about refugees. We're not talking about asylum seekers, yeah? So we're talking about uh, refugees who have refugee status because otherwise you're not eligible for resettlement, no matter what. Um, but first, before we get into resettlement, uh, I would just shortly talk about what happens before. So um, what happens after you fled your own country? 
And um, we mostly talk about Jordan today because my uh, my because uh, that's what I know. Uh, my case study is Jordan to to Germany, so a settlement from Jordan to, to Germany. So that's what we also talk about today. And as you can imagine, most of the refugees who are staying in Jordan come from Syria. Um, and so just imagine uh, or just say you're a, a refugee from Syria, you flee your own country, where would you generally go? Um, and I think it's quite clear that this is mostly first to um, to neighboring countries because most people have to get there by, by foot, walking, uh, taking a bus, car, what, what have you. Um, and so if you, if you look on the map or on the right side um, of the presentation screen, you can see that uh, Syria is bordering Turkey, Iraq, uh, Jordan, Israel, and, and Lebanon. And most of the people go to either Turkey, Jordan, and, and Lebanon. And so once, uh, once you, again, you made it to the border, mostly by foot, car, or bus. Um, the first thing you get at the border, mostly by, by, by soldiers. And then uh, very often you will first live in the refugee camp uh, for a, a specific time, uh, period of time. Um, and this is, for example, a picture from a refugee camp in Jordan as well. So you mostly have tents. You might have some, some uh, containers as well. So this is where you will stay for the first uh, period of time, sometimes only some days, sometimes for a very long period. Um, but if you're lucky and you, for example, have relatives or you know anybody else in, in the city, uh, let's say Amman, that's the capital of Jordan, and you also, for example, have the money if you don't have a relative very good stay, but you still have enough money to actually pay for a flat, you might then be able to, to go to Amman, get a flat uh, and live there amongst uh, Jordanian uh, citizens, other refugees, and, and so forth. Um, and so once you made it to, uh, to a man, for example, um, you will need to somehow get refugee status to be able to stay in the country, right? Because if you don't, you will be illegally uh, legal there and you might be deported. Um, sooner or later. So what you will do is to um, basically get all your family, even if, you're, if, if they're babies, for example, the whole family uh, will need to go to UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, so you're in, um, refugee agency, and you will need to register there and hopefully also get refugee status from them. Um, and this is the, the middle picture, that's not, a, that's not the UNHCR office in Amman, it's actually one uh, in, in Syria itself, it's a really new one, but they kind of look the same everywhere. So you would uh, have like a building <laughs> with a flag, uh, you have a um, kind of a wall with a small door, uh, you have to queue, you get into a big waiting room, um, and then eventually they very often have these kind of containers, um, like the blue one you have on, uh, on, on the left side of the screen, you have the different containers and you queue and then you, um, you get registered. Um, they don't do fingerprints anymore, at least not in Jordan, but they do something more high-tech sci-fi. Uh, they scan the iris, they scan the, the, the eye, because this is something you can do also with children. Because if you're a child and you take fingerprints, they still change. But uh, taking the eye, the iris scan, um, you can identify the persons from a very early age onwards. Um, and then you give them all details, family details and so forth, where you came from uh, and all of those issues. And then um, hopefully, and if you're Syrian, that's generally the case um, because people know what you what the situation in Syria is like in Jordan. Um, you get your UNHCR refugee certificate, which you can see on, on the right side. Um, it has your picture on it, all your data, and also states that you are a refugee recognized under UNHCR. And this is the most important document you have as a refugee. It's kind of your passport. You can't lose it. It's the one that entitles you to, to stay in the country, to give you some rights. You also have to come back every year to renew it, but this is kind of the most important document you would have. 
Um, and so this is how you get refugee status in, in, in Jordan. It might look differently. For example, as you noticed, the UNHCR is doing refugee status determination in Jordan. Um, in other countries, it might be the government. Um, but this is how it works, works in Jordan. Um, and then generally, the high majority of people who receive refugee status in Jordan will just stay there. Um, and as I said, they have some rights. Um, so they might, they might get like a small cash uh, cash allowance, for example, from UNHCR to uh, kind of tie over. Um, but it doesn't mean that you live a happy and decent life. Most of the people really suffer because you, you're not allowed to work in many occupations. Um, medical treatment is very, very expensive, even if you're Jordanian and if you're refugee, it's even more expensive. Um, it's not your, it's like people have prejudices, of course. Um, it's not your own country, you don't know how it works. So it's really difficult for many people. And especially, for example, if you, if you, for example, have a serious medical condition that can't be treated in Jordan, uh, or it's just way too expensive, um, many people, uh, don't have their their parents anymore. The parents are dead or they are nobody knows where they are. You have many widows um, without a husband and it's very difficult for a single woman to live in Jordan because it's not how the society works. You need to have a male person to, to care for you. So for all of those people, it's even more difficult to, to make their life and to, to go through life, in, in, in this case, in Jordan. And for these people, refugee resettlement is intended to be the solution to their displacement. Um, and just to make it in a very short definition, UNHCR themselves define resettlement as the selection and transfer of refugee from one state in which they have sought protection to a third state which has agreed to admit them. So in our case, again, uh, if you're Syrian, you made it to the, to the border, you made it into a Jordan, you received your refugee status in Jordan, and then Germany agrees to admit you, and they put you in a plane uh, and take you over to Germany where you can then hopefully uh, live in dignity and peace for your life and get integrated. Um, that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, practically, it works with annual quotas. So in our case, again, Germany decides how many people they would like to resettle per year. And then they also agree to admit them as refugees. Again, you have to be a refugee to be able to be entitled for resettlement. But in this case, you also don't have to apply for it again once you're there. Yeah, so you already receive, if you, if you get resettlement, you know that you will be able to stay in the country, in this case in Germany, and you also have some rights. You have some, you can, uh, you, you can go to school uh, in, in our context here for this workshop, uh, very importantly, um, you are allowed to work, you are also allowed to receive medical treatment and so forth. So that is clear from the beginning. You don't have to go through the whole process again. Um, and unfortunately, again, this only applies for a very uh, tiny amount of people. And it's also at the moment kind of the only legal pathway for, for refugees, for displaced persons to Europe or any other safe country in the world. If you, for example, uh, if, you're, if you're European, and I'm, I'm sure you still have kind of the images from the so-called uh, refugee crisis in 2015 in your mind, these are people who, who fled, but they were not able to go through resettlement. Instead, they had to, uh, which is still the case at, at the moment, of course, um, to get into, into a dingy into a in a small boat and try to get through uh, over the Mediterranean to to the European Union. And I'm sorry for interruption. If I may ask you to wrap up a little bit because uh, it's already twenty five past. So just just take yeah. take some more time. Please. Yeah, sure. Um, so again, um, yeah, it's only a solution for for a few people. So we won't go through the resettlement process uh, as such, just to, to give you an idea that it's not 
as straightforward as the definition says. You have different actors involved in it. It takes a lot of time. It's not that you're called as a refugee. Uh, hey, do you want to be resettled? And you say yes. And then two, two days you sit in the, in, in the plane. That's not how it works, obviously. So it takes a lot of time until people are finally uh, be able to integrate uh, in the new host society. And also, and now coming to, to, to the agency of refugees, as I said, it's only applicable for, for a tiny number of people. Um, and also, as a refugee, you have very low agency within the, in the process. Um, so you can't apply for a resettlement yourself. You might get a call from your SCR or you might not, but you can't go there actively and ask for it. Uh, and you also can't decide uh, where you want to go um and when you want to go so if they tell you you can you can go to uh to germany and you don't want to go to germany then you just don't get resettled it's not that you can can ask for another country yeah um but nevertheless you will need to at some point decide if you actually want to be resettled or not right you still need to make that choice if you actually want to stay where you are at the moment in this case jordan or if, if you want to go to Germany in, in our case. Um, and so there are many different, obviously it's an individual choice, but there are many uh, expectations they kind of come back um, for, for many people. So in the case of uh, people who want to be resettled, um, the first expectation mostly is kind of learning the local language, of course, it's kind of a prerequisite to do anything else afterwards. Um, education is a very big issue um, for their children, but also for themselves. Um, finding work as well. I think that that's something you will go through uh, over in, in the remainder of the workshop. Medical assistance again, and basically to, to live a life in dignity uh, and peace. Um, but as a last point, it's not the case that everybody wants to be settled. It's not that whenever you, you ask a refugee if they want to go somewhere, they will always say yes. That's just not it. Um, and also for very good reasons. So for example, one reason is that you can only take your, your nuclear family, so only yourself and your children if they are under 18 with you, not your, not your mom, not your grandma and so forth. And that's a, that's a big issue for, for people, of course, also because they won't be able to come back in the near future or maybe ever. And that, which also brings me already to my second point, is that many people want to want to return to Syria, for example. Um, and so they really try to stay close to their home. And if they're in Jordan, it's only a, a, around the border. Um, cultural reasons obviously also play a, a, a big role. Um, for example, religion is very differently and so forth. And again, I mean, these are people who um, already started a new life maybe several times already, so it's also often very difficult. Um, there are also many rumors and misinformation and all in all, it's kind of the fear of the unknown. If I would now decide to, that if I could move to, I don't know, Paraguay, I also wouldn't know what to expect. Um, so that's just also obviously for anybody uh, affected to factor in. Um, so that's from my side again, finding work. If we don't look at the reasons to reject resettlement, but for people who, and that is still the high majority of people who want to be resettled, finding work and being integrated into the labor market is uh, one of the biggest expectations they have. They know that it's not easy, but it's um, that's one thing that they that they really look forward um, to, and so to basically to be become self-sufficient and be integrated. Um, and that's basically from my side. And I'm happy to. I didn't have time to look at the comment sections now, but if you have any questions or comments happy to to answer any of those so i will get out of the presentation because then i can actually see you um. all right thank you so much uh before uh, eleonora begins with her uh, presentation i think we can open the floor for some questions remarks or opinions if there are any uh regarding uh, hannah's presentation so the floor is open. Uh, if anyone would like to make a comment, 
put a question. You could do it either verbally or you could write it in the comment section. I think we need an icebreaker for that. I, if I may again. <laughs> sure. Thank you. So, uh, Hannah, you you also you mentioned about the case of Jordan for the resettlement, and you also mentioned that uh, in the case of Jordan, the, uh, most of the uh, uh, refugees there are from Syria. But I know from uh, in the other cases in uh, some other countries, for example, in Turkey, uh, the resettlement process happens basically based on some preferences among the refugees. For example. Syrians are in the priority, and then those who are coming from Africa or Afghanistan, they are the least priority. Uh, so is that also applied to the case of Jordan or it's uh, somehow different there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, it is, and it also poses a lot of huge problems for people who are actually not Syrian. Because I mean, also if you're a Syrian, your life is not great in Jordan nothing like that but still you you there are some occupations that you can work in you you for example have the possibility to be resettled and so forth um, if you are from from any other nationality let's say Yemen for example there are quite a lot of Yemenis uh, or Iraq um, Iraqis uh, in Jordan you mostly will be there illegally. You won't get refugee protection in, in most cases. Um, from, from the resettlement country's perspective, so let's say in the case of Germany, um, they still take people. They, still, they would still take you if you're uh, Yemeni, for example. So they don't say yeah, we, only take, we only take Syrians, but just what the, the benefits or the protection you receive in Jordan, it's really only for Syrian refugees at the moment. And as you just said, that's in, very, in many cases as, as well. In, in Turkey, that's a high preferences for Syrians. It's also a more straightforward situation at the moment because you can clearly see, okay, there is a war going on. This is why you get protection. In Yemen, it's kind of the same, so it would be the same approach. But for for uh, for many other countries, that's not the case. You need to look closer into into the cases. But yeah, it, it it's huge problems for the refugees. Any other question, remarks, opinions? Well, we have some, some time, some minutes for some questions. Uh, I would like to re-encourage you for, for some questions, if you have, for some remarks, opinions. Can I ask something? Yeah, yeah sure. Sure, go on. Uh, so, do you have the data or the information who are resettled, uh, like which groups are resettled mostly, men, women, families, single women, or uh, families with children or unaccompanied children? What is the situation demographically, uh, mm -hmm. or maybe the, the age groups? Yeah, also a great question, actually. Um, so just from my own experiences, so the data is generally not disaggregated. So if you look at the numbers, you... Uh, it, it doesn't become clear, but just from my own experiences, who I talk to, uh, who were people who were resettled, it's it's mostly families. Um, so maybe I would say people like the mom and dad would be around 40, 50, uh, and then you have sometimes one kid, sometimes five, de depending depending on the situations. You also have some some young couples for example, um, and also some, some rather old people who generally then already have family uh, in Germany, for example. So they are resettled to, to be able to, um, to meet and to be reunified with their family. 
uh, but mostly it's, it's families and mostly you can also see that people have medical conditions. So I would normally not have to ask why they would be resettled. You can kind of see, okay, the child needs to have a special treatment that's not available in Jordan. The dad has had a um, work accident in Jordan, so he can't use his uh, hand anymore. And that's why they received resettlement. So it's mostly about medical conditions. It's quite clear why they would be resettled. Any question, further remarks? Uh, if not, Hannah, I would like to take the opportunity of being the moderator and, and, and put you a question. There was a slide in your presentation with respect to um, learning the local language uh, in, in the place of resettlement. Uh, let's say uh, there is a family or a person, refugee, who wish to be resettled in Germany, but at the moment he or she is in, in Jordan. She or he, uh, rejects to learn the local language, which is most probably Arabic, uh, because of the fact that, or because of the idea that she or he would like to resettle in Germany finally, so that it would be a waste of time or it would be difficult to learn the local language. So if this is the case, I don't know, but what, what kind of problems those people who are wishing to be resettled finally in a different country, but still is it is, is in a different country, like as it is the case with a person in Jordan would like to be resettled finally in Germany. What kind of problems we have between local community, hosting community, hosting a country, and those people who are wishing to be resettled finally in a different country? Mm. Um, so in, in the case of, of Jordan, and I think that applies for at least for the Middle East, but not Turkey, um, the, the language will be the same, right? Like people can communicate that you might hear different dialects of course you might know that this person is from syria or or any any or yemen for example but the people are still able to communicate which of course already helps in turkey it's a different matter of course so in turkey you will need to learn the language um and everybody I met also did know at least some Turkish, uh, especially children, of course, um, because they go to school, um, husband, because they were working for the wives, it's mostly more difficult. It's exactly the same if you, than uh, what you see in, uh, after they are resettled, basically. Um, so... But to, to talk about the, like kind of the problematic issues between um, like the host community and refugees, very often, um, very often the case, especially now, if you, for example, look now at uh, Lebanon, which goes through a huge crisis, uh, everything is getting so much more expensive. The same, but not to like, not, of course, not to the extent, but also in, in, in Jordan, in Turkey, many people struggle although they are not refugees. Um, and so, especially if you have a high number of refugees, which is the case in most of these countries, it's very easy to basically um, have this idea that, okay, the government is taking care of refugees, but it's not taking care of myself, even though I'm a citizen. And this is a very difficult balance to, to play out. And that's also the case why you would very often see, for example, if you have any NGOs, if you have any UN organizations who work uh, in, not UNHCR because UNHCR is obviously responsible for refugees, but any other ones, they would be very uh, careful to also have services for vulnerable communities who are in the country. So not to basically create this to uh, two different streams where you have kind of um, discrimination uh, against uh, different people. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult balance to, to make. There was one more question um, in, in the chat um, concerning the duration of the resettlement process. Also a great question, actually. <laughs> um, so that really depends. In the case of, uh, it also depends on a different resettlement country. So with resettlement country, I mean the country where people will eventually go. So for example, the US had at the moment, because of the current administration and really went down with the numbers, but it had a very big resettlement program, but the, the process can take up to two years. 
which obviously, as you just said, uh, you think about, like you have the idea that you will be able to be resettled, but then it takes one or two years. It's obviously very problematic because you're not, you, you're not there in your mind still in, in the country where you are. But that's kind of the, that's, that's a really long time for the US. Germany, it also depends, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's only a few months, uh, depending on uh, the possibilities to resettle. It's also, I mean, just imagine it's, it's a huge organization, right? That you need to accumulate people to be able to put them in one plane and not, in, and not separately. So just the organization is really difficult. So, but generally for Germany, it takes about like half a year uh, until people are flown out, which is uh, considered to be very fast, actually. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions for the remarks? If not, uh, I would like to shift to um, Eleonora Lamia. So uh, if you have any question, any remarks. All right, then, then I will give the floor to Eleonora. Uh, she will deliver her presentation about refugees' access to the labor market in Europe and, and Belgium. Uh, Eleonora, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm Eleonora, nice to meet you all. Um, I would just start uh, by saying that uh, I'm not at all an expert like Hannah. <laughs> I don't have a PhD in migration nor on refugee studies, so um, I'm very sorry, Hannah, if you're what I say might sound uh, not clear or uh, not enough uh, clear as your presentation, of course, because I'm not like an expert on this. Um, I will start sharing my screen so that you can see my presentation. Okay, can you see that? It's fine. Yes, okay. yes, it's fine. Um, so yes, I would just start by saying that uh, I'm a project manager in the DSS network, which is a network speci specialized on uh, social economy. Uh, we are a very large European network with uh, almost 40 members that are themselves um, a network or organizations that work on social economy and development of social economy in Europe. Um, however, we mainly work on project management in very different topics. I don't know if you're familiar with social economy, but um, social economy in general can touch many, many different fields, as you can uh, see here. Sorry, I will put larger. Okay, as you can see here, it can touch uh, many topics, and in particular, as um, and Bubeker said before, uh, I follow projects on migration and social economy and social dialogue. Uh, this is why I'm familiar with the topic, but not like Hannah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So, um, well, Hannah, thank you very much because actually you did what I was about to do also, which is a uh, definition. So we can uh, uh, skip that. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, personally, I'm more familiar with uh, the topic of migration that refugee because I work mainly on that. And throughout my presentation, I will present statistics that, um, uh, that mention migrants uh, that are present in Europe from outside the EU. And as Hannah mentioned before, not all the migrants are refugees. So I would just like to underline that so, so that there is no confusion um, after. So statistics between migrants coming from outside the EU and refugees are always a bit different. And generally speaking, as we will see later on, statistics for refugees are always a bit lower than for migrants because there is um, a difference as Hannah uh, clearly mentioned before. So before starting to uh, discuss uh, specifically the integration in the labor market, I just wanted to share with you some numbers that I think are interesting, which is, uh, which are that generally in uh, Europe last year, uh, around 5% uh, of uh, the people living in Europe were migrants coming from outside the EU, which I don't know what you think, but I think it's a great number. And 5% only from those coming outside the EU, because as uh, Anna mentioned before, I'm also a migrant, but I'm Italian. So if we count 
all the people that are not living for in the uh, are not living in the country from where they're from that's a huge number which means that europe is highly multicultural um another uh, other interesting numbers are um the large number of uh, uh, migrants and that entered the EU in 2018, which were uh, almost 2.5 million. And the um, main countries that received those migrants uh, in the last years were Germany, Spain, France, and Italy. So let's keep the statistics because Anna already mentioned this. So um, when we uh, speak about migrants integration in the labor markets, Again, migrants coming from outside the EU, so for instance, me and Hannah do not enter in this. Um, we can say that the employment rate generally for these migrants is low, that the employment rates from the native born and from uh, migrants coming from another EU member states. And uh, at the same time, logically, the unemployment rate is higher than uh, um, citizens from the European Union. I have here some statistics from Eurostat, which are, um, which speaks by themselves, I think. As you can see, there is a really high difference between the countries in the European Union. Um, sometimes it's really hard to say because not all the countries have statistics. So, but generally, as you can see, there is a huge difference for instance, between uh, Greece and countries like uh, Latvia, Russia. And um, as you can see, the unemployment from, of non-EU born um, uh, is uh, very high in some, generally very high in all the countries, but especially in some. While in others, uh, it's, the situation is better. For instance, as I mentioned, uh, um, Croatia and Latvia. Um, here, uh, I wanted to show you some maps that um, generally show the same thing, but uh, for each country, these are activity rates. The first one you have for nationals from citizens from other uh, EU member states, and the third one is for non-EU citizens. And you can clearly see from the colors that um, the rate of activity is much lower from migrants from non-EU. Um, this is the uh, unemployment rates um, by country of birth and by citizenship. And uh, um, we can see that there has been an improvement actually in the last years. As you can see, um, the highest unemployment rates were uh, around 2012 and 13, which is normal. And now the situation is clearly improving in general for everybody, but in particular also for non-EU born. And um, however, this, uh, I, I don't have more recent statistic, but it will be really interesting to see how the situation will evolve after the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis because we believe, I mean, we believe, uh, it is believed, not me personally, that the situation will get worse, especially for migrants um, in the next month, but it will, we will have to see the, this um, maybe next year. Um, then I wanted to show you uh, some numbers which are also very, very interesting. These are employment rates according to the level of education and gender. So, for instance, you can see that in general, the more you're educated, the more you have the chance to be employed. Um, which, of course, is normal, but I mean, normal, it, it, it's understandable. Um, but you can clearly see that there are a difference between uh, you born and non-newborn. Generally, non-newborn, which is the orange one, is always a bit lower than uh, you born uh, persons. Um, and another thing that it's interesting is that if it's true that gender gap exists also for uh, Europeans, this gender gap is much higher for um, non-EU-born persons, uh, which is clearly shown here. 
And uh, in this case, women coming from outside the EU with a low level of education really suffer from, um, from this problem. Um, going forward, I just wanted to show you also the youth employment rate. So uh, you, for youth, we consider um, young people from 15 to 24. And this is really interesting because it really depends on the country. Of course, the overall um, employment is low because a lot of, I mean, a lot. Uh, many people are still studying or not necessarily look for a job when you're under 24. Um, and the situation really, really varies uh, among the countries. This is why it's not very interesting to look at uh, the EU um, average numbers, but, um, but all the European ones. So just keep in mind that for youth employment, it really varies according on the country. Um, and this is the last statistic that I wanted to share with you, which is long-term unemployment. Um, long-term unemployment is considered when a person is looking uh, for a job for more than one year. And what is really, really interesting is that you can see that actually migrants, or in this case, more specifically, non-EU born are much more resilient than native born, meaning that um, they are less long-term unemployment than for people uh, coming from the EU. And that can be explained by different reasons. For instance, that uh, maybe a migrant can accept a low-skilled job uh, more easily than uh, a European citizen, for instance or that uh, for them it's harder to get a job and so they are, are more willing to make um, concessions in some, in some way. Um, but now let's speak about why it's so important for migrants to integrate the labor market. Um, first of all, uh, it's because um, Overall, everywhere, but especially in Europe, you can say that you're really integrated when you participate to the labor market. So when you're active, when you do something. And so to uh, allow these migrants to really build a new life and really integrate the European society, also from a cultural and from a, a social point of view, to work, it's really, really important. And um, the second point is it's because it's very important for European citizens, but it's also very important from them to know that they're contributing very positively to the European economy. I think it's, this is crucial from both sides because I think that for both sides it's important um, to, to be aware of the power and of the concrete contribution that uh, they bring to, to us and to them in general. And um, the third thing of why it's so important, this labor integration, is that they can really contribute to addressing a skill shortage. And um, this can happen at all skills level, really. Also from very low skill jobs to very high, high skills jobs, because there are many people that are Re extremely highly educated that we, from, from some um, job that we miss, that really contribute to, to, uh, to our economic development. Which are the main, main problems and the main barriers for um, labor integration? First of all, as uh, Hannah mentioned also in her presentation, is the language barrier. So, um, is it true that a lot of people that enter Europe already speak English? But it is also true that in many countries, English is not enough when you want to work. Of course, we live uh, in Belgium where English is more or less a common language, but not always. And in many countries like, I don't know, Italy, I'm from Italy. In Italy, if you don't speak Italian, it's very different, to, it's very different and difficult to enter the job market. Um, a second uh, main issue is the uh, educational skill validation, so diploma validation, and also the recognition of the past professional experience. Um, this may uh, vary from country to country uh, in Europe, but it can take a lot of time. Another problem is the uh, training. A lot of migrants come here and 
even if they are highly educated, they have to adapt to our labor market. And if th many times they do not get adequate training. The fourth problem, and Anna also mentioned this before, thank you, is prejudices and racism that uh, can change from country to country, from city to city, but are, it's, a, it's a general problem that um, still exists. Then uh, another issue, it's uh, hiring channels and low awareness, meaning that um, in globally all the countries, it's very difficult for an employee to employ a migrant because they, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how, how, to, how, to, um, how to find the right person. And for many cases, also for the migrants, it's very difficult to know in a new country how to access the job market, from where to start, uh, from where to start to look for a job, to do the interviews, how to be prepared for uh, to to present a CV, for instance, which are very simple things, but they're not they're not granted at all when it comes to a person that has just arrived to uh, to Europe. And another main issue is illegal employment and moonlighting because. A lot of migrants work in Europe, but work without a contract, with really low salaries, with really low, if any, uh, employment conditions, which of course it's a problem. So uh, the solutions to the problems we just mentioned are, <laughs> I think very obvious, but not for that very easy to, to develop, which are language courses, uh, validation of diplomas and professional skills, continuous education, fighting prejudices and change of uh, the narrative around migration, a clear employment structure, fighting illegal employment and moonlighting. And uh, uh, last thing that I wanted to talk a bit, it's uh, to promote migrant entrepreneurship. Um, so this very quick, quickly, we don't have to think that nothing is being done actually a lot has been done in the last years and will still be done. Uh, for instance, the European Union launched the action plan for integration of third country nationals in 2016, which addresses exactly these problems and many others. But we don't have much time, so let's go forward. Um, Yes, I wanted to focus just uh, uh, shortly on migrant entrepreneurship because um, I carry out a project on this topic and um, migrant entrepreneurship can really uh, contribute to migrant employability, not only for the, the, the migrant that creates a new, a new business, but also because migrants tend to employ other migrants. So they tend to bring a solution to their own problem, which is great. And um, migrant entrepreneurship, it's um, also very important because they allow us to create new bridges to new markets and to uh, find new solutions to or unmet problems or to find new solutions for problems that are there, but they really are able to bring innovation in this sense. Of course, also migrant entrepreneurship has uh, many problems and many barriers, which are in particular legal, cultural, and uh, financial access barriers. Um, then let's end by speaking really quickly about Belgium. Um, so in uh, Belgium, uh, labor market integration is still uh, a real problem. There are really uh, high gaps between employability of um, migrants coming from outside the EU and the other citizen, especially this is very pronounced for women. And here, the very interesting thing is that in Belgium, the language barrier is much um, it's much easier because a lot of people that come here already speak French. Uh, however, um, two main uh, problems is that, uh, as you know, Belgium, it's really a mess. <laughs> I mean, the administrative structure of Belgium, it's really complicated. And 
um, consequently, the, the access to the market, it's really complicated because it can, it can really change from where you live, from the city you live, from the language that you have to speak in order to access the labor market. So for instance, if you're a migrant that come from uh, um, North Africa, maybe you already speak French, but if you go to uh, Antwerp, it doesn't, it's not very useful. So uh, it's really complicated. And then there are other uh, specific difficulties, um, uh, especially discrimination, as we mentioned if, the before, and the recognition of diplomas that can take really a long time. Um, I just wanted to end my presentation by saying that I didn't include on purpose the, um, the fields where migrants mostly work because I think it, it's, um, it doesn't make really sense because it really depends on the countries. For instance, in, in Northern Europe, like Sweden, uh, many, many migrants work in really high skilled jobs while in others, it's not like this. So, uh, I mean, before you ask question, it was on purpose. <laughs> and I just wanted to end very quickly by mentioning that um, in the ASIS network, the organization I work for, we have many, many interest projects uh, covering the topic of migration. Um, these are some of them, but then you can have the presentation and if you wish, you can look at our website and write me if you have more questions. But we mainly work on migrant entrepreneurship, my, migrant narrative, um, the link, the importance of digitalization in the migrants' labor inclusion, and other projects in general regarding migrants' labor inclusion in some specific um, countries of Europe. And that's it. I hope it was clear. I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, Eleonora, thank you so much for this very fruitful uh, presentation. I personally learn and enjoy a lot. So as we did uh, in the first session, I would like to open the floor again for questions, remarks, opinions, if you have. Uh, could I ask a question, please? Sure, go on. Hi, uh, my name is Martina. I'm here representing, can you hear me properly with the earphone, with the headphone? It's fine. Okay. Uh, so my name is Martin and I'm here representing the European Students Union. I just want to say thank you, Eleonora, for your presentation. I found it really interesting even to see the numbers and, and your analysis uh, of the situation, the problems and, and possible solutions. Um, and one of the solutions you mentioned is the validation of qualifications um, and, and learning. Uh, from our end, we are, we are working on promoting the European Qualifications Passport and really understanding where countries are, are helping each other out to, to sort of implement that mechanism of recognizing qualifications. Uh, within your network, uh, do you have experience working with the ECPR? Do you know of any um, migrants and refugees who have made use of this? Do they find any challenges with it? Do you, what do you think of it? Do you think it's a good way forward to, 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 as a possible solution to think, uh, enhance validation of qualification? That would be my question. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Martina. Uh, unfortunately, I don't personally work um, in, in this field, in the field of recognition of uh, education and diploma. Uh, it's a pity, but with my projects, I don't cover this topic. Um, uh, and I don't uh, uh, directly work with people that do so, so I'm kind of afraid I won't be able to answer your questions. But what I can say is that the main problem is that all the countries have a different, uh, a different way. To, of course, there are guidelines, but uh, all the countries have different processes. And um, it can vary also from the country of origin of the migrant and the country and, and the type of diploma that they have. So yeah, I agree that it's really, it's really a big issue. And it's also, it's not just an issue, it's also a pity for, for, for all the European countries because it's uh, an exploited uh, labor force that can be also very 
high qualified but also unqualified that can be really um, an asset for us and uh, I totally agree that uh, it's uh, it's a shame all right thank you so much any any other question remarks if I may go on please okay thank you very much <clears throat> So maybe I, I first uh, introduce myself so that you, you, you get uh, the, the point of the question. So my name is Ahmad Wali. I am a, a PhD student uh, at the VUB. And uh, also I worked before for about uh, three years uh, on uh, migrant integration and labor market integration of migrants in Europe and especially in Belgium. So what I'm going to say is that uh, it's not a personal critique on you or on what, what you said. It's, 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 it's a very interesting presentation. And also it's, uh, you mentioned that you are not working on the field, but when we are talking about the integration of migrants, <clears throat> here is two things. One is the integration of migrants from a migrant perspective, and the other is from the government and from politicians perspective. Okay. So, Unfortunately, in many cases, usually even in the European uh, level, uh, integration is made equivalent to the labor market integration. And there is a problem with that because for a migrant, labor market integration is the last stage of, of integration. While for the politicians, it is the first step of, of integration. To clar clarify what, what I mean is, for example, in 2017 to 2018, the Belgian government decided that, okay, because we see in the statistics that migrants are not integrated, so let's help them with the labor market integration without going to migrants and asking them or seeing that what migrants want, they just eased the, their policies and they removed all the restrictions and they pushed everyone into the labor market. So the immediate result was good. So they, they, they forced so many people to go to work. And then what happened after a year, uh, the, 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 the unemployment after the first employment was super high because these people were forced into the high end jobs that, that they didn't want to do. And then it created even more problems because uh, uh, after that you once went to the labor market, then you cannot go back to a study or you cannot go back to them because uh, in the beginning you have a package for integration from the government. And then once you're in the labor market, it means that you, you lost the package. So that's why there is a resistance between the immigrants and between the, between the government. So these are also, like the points that, that we always have to mention that when we talk about uh, integration, it's not always about labor market integration. And in many cases, uh, labor market integration can prevent the integration. And, uh, and this is something that we always have to consider when uh, we discuss integration. And integration is a very sensitive topic nowadays uh, in every country in Europe. We don't even have a proper definition of integration. What are the measures for integration? How do you measure someone who is integrated or not? So that, that was just uh, an opinion about uh, the integration. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ahmad, for this interesting point. Uh, are there any further questions, may I ask? Go on. Yeah. Uh, I think it will be a follow-up to uh, Ahmed's uh, question. So you briefly mentioned uh, the, the quality, why you did not include the, the, the works that migrants have uh, for a reason, but I really would like to still ask this question about the quality of the work, because unfortunately Nordic countries are not a model for uh, other parts of Europe in that, in many other issues as well. Uh, so like within labor market integration, let's, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm going to criticize the, the wording of integration as well, but in a different way, because uh, we might talk about labor market integration, but um, these people are having jobs, but we don't look at the quality of the jobs. We cannot see this in the data. So we can only see if these people have a job or not. 
uh, but uh, I work a lot with migrant and refugee women in Europe. And what we see is so-called de-skilling, especially for women, uh, yes. for men as well. But since it is our target group, so we mostly focus on that part. Uh, so, for example, and we see how, especially European Commission funded projects, um, we also work on uh, these projects, but still, uh, I think we have a right to criticize. Uh, so We should. We yes, should. <laughs> yeah. Today, we, we did not criticize a lot, and I really like to criticize a bit. Uh, so, for example, we see a woman cook uh, who is a doctor, who was previously a doctor, who had the qualifications, but who ended up being a cook or having a small business, uh, a really small business, maybe she, she could do more with her qualifications. But at the end of the day, we show her as an example in our projects. And uh, so we show the pictures and how she's successful, how she's earning money, but we don't talk about the, the quality of the work and how we can help this person to improve herself. For example, learning the language more, especially with entrepreneurship, it's a bit tricky, it, which is a really alternative way uh, for economic integration, I believe that. But at the same time, they are not really encouraged to learn the language and do other aspects of uh, so-called integration in the host country because they immediately start working with their co-ethnics most of the time. Uh, and this is, uh, not always the case for refugees. This is also the case for Latin American women, for example, who migrated to, to Europe uh, as family, um, like with family unification, and also long-term settled migrants as well, uh, along with refugees uh, and other third country nationals. So this is a really huge problem. And we cannot, we didn't action plan as well. This is something that uh, we criticize a lot because they're only looking at the, um, the numbers in the labor market, if you're integrated or not, if you are paying your social contributions and if you have a job, that's it, so you're integrated. Uh, do you have like, and uh, the migration pact is coming, uh, we are waiting a new migration pact and uh, we have this COVID situation, so a lot of things are changing. So we cannot talk about uh, integration and migration as the way we talked before, especially this labor market part and especially uh, like the quality of the jobs. Do you have any recommendations or any critics about this or any ideas that you would like to share how we can really work on this quality of work part? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, comment. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, uh, I totally share your opinion that uh, it's not only a problem, but also a shame that uh, people that are highly qualified uh, end up uh, not only accepting, but also maybe creating new businesses that um, that do not fit actually their uh, their qualification. Um, however, uh, I still think that that um, at the beginning that can be a solution because still working and earning money will uh, allow uh, a woman or a family to start a new life in Europe. But I totally agree with you that um, there should be uh, new policies and recommendations that uh, encourage and allow uh, not, not only women, but I mean men, everybody in general, to, uh, to, to uh, to do not do not accept the situation as it is, and to try to, uh, to try to not not only to get the recognition, but also to also to get a job that uh, fits better their qualification. Um, I, th I, I I don't know how to personally <laughs> solve the problem, but I think it's something that should really be more included in the not only political debate, but also in the policy making. And um, I don't know how the uh, European legal framework will evolve on that, but I totally share your opinion that this should be more present. It was very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. 
thank you so much. If there is no further question, I would like to... Oh, okay, we have a question from Julian. Go on. Uh, I, I just have a comment to add, if it's possible. And um, I'm a student from uh, Sciences Po Grenoble. I'm just assisting to the conference. I just want to add something... I'm sorry, to... because you, you always seem more, more expert than me, actually. <laughs> so I'm also <laughs> learning no, from No, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not my case. not my case. But like, I, I just want to add something to what said, uh, so what Sinem and uh, Ahmad said. I have the impression that uh, this this debate is running too fast, and it's meaning it's missing one point in my opinion. Uh, it's too focused on what is happening in northern countries, like in Belgium, in the situation in uh, Scandinavian countries. Because uh, I totally agree on the fact that there is this uh, cutting out migrants from their skills, from their uh, what they're more able to do and forcing them to work in many cases. But we are also, also missing one fact that in many other countries in Europe, especially in southern countries, uh, for instance, in Italy, in Spain, uh, the problem of illegal work, of uh, underwater work, it's enormous. Like in Italy, only two or three months ago, 600,000 migrants have been regularized and they were all illegal workers until the day before. So, I mean, until we don't reach an uh, appreciable inclusion on huge numbers of cutted out migrants from the uh, labor market in, in its totality, I think it's early to talk about how to uh, discriminate between high, low and uh, different skills, which is a high issue, I'm not undermining it. But I mean, I think that in the, in the process, there, is, there are, uh, I mean, heavier issues that are, have not yet been taken uh, seriously, if you allow me to use the term by many European governments. So I don't know, especially how it is in, in Northern Europe, probably uh, they're uh, forward in, uh, in the process of absorbing in the labor market, and maybe they put it maybe too forward, absorbing too many people in the labor market without uh, caring about their skills. But in many other countries, in the largest countries of the South, the, the problem is the opposite. Like you, you have no absorption at all. And uh, many people provide that like with illegal work and, and uh, whatsoever. So it was just to add uh, a view. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the point. So now I would like to uh, give the floor to Katia Lopez, uh, our project partner from Portugal, uh, for a short intervention to comment on the issues from, from a Portuguese context. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank um, uh, Vocal for, for this lab and thank uh, Hannah and Eleonora for the excellent presentations. And thank also uh, all the participants for, for being here. I'm Katia Lopes from EMVF from, from Portugal. Uh, and I'm going to talk about them very briefly because I only have 10 minutes uh, about um, uh, myths and realities in migration and give some examples of the integration in, in Portugal. I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> You can see? Yes, yes, okay. we can see that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, EMVF, uh, Instituto Marquês de Valsor, uh, was founded in 1951 by initiative of Valsor uh, Marchionis, Dona Maria do, do Carmo Pinto, uh, in order to perpetuate the memory uh, of her husband. Uh, so, our name should be Institute Marchioness Valflor, and that's why uh, gender justice is, uh, is still a fight. <laughs> uh, we are from, from Portugal, uh, an NGDO from, from Portugal that starts its work in 1988. Um, we contribute towards uh, sustainable uh, development and promotion of human dignity by designing, implementing, and uh, collaborating in projects in, uh, and activities in a diverse range of areas as education, migration, and global citizenship 
and in others. We are in many places as Portugal, uh, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, uh, Colombia, São Tomé e Príncipe, Angola and, and other places. And uh, our team, <laughs> this is a Global Citizenship Unit uh, where, uh, where I work with my two, two colleagues. About, about the myths and, uh, and uh, the realities, um, um, in migration, uh, all myths and, and realities are deconstructed by, uh, all myths are deconstructed by the realities, by the numbers, by the facts that Hannah and Eleonora, Eleonora show us uh, uh, so well. Um, and we can see also this information in this study this study made it by uh, Patricia Magalhães Ferreira, uh, Migration and Development. And um, that say that most of the existing, existing needs about migrations are disassembled by facts. For example, the, imp uh, the improvement of, sorry, of socioeconomic economic development at national level tends to stimulate in the short and medium term in, in an increase of uh, international let me just put, migration rather than a decrease. Um, about, about the myths, the, the author lists seven myths in, in our study. I'm going to, to show you only three, three of, of them. Uh, the the myths uh, three say that development cooperation can reduce uh, irregular migration. Uh, we uh, we frequently heard that uh, irregular migration and the so-called refugee crisis in the Mediterranean can be resolved if we take the, the measures to prevent and um, to prevent these people from leaving their countries uh, of origin. Uh, the reality, the main goal of the European de development policy uh, policy is to reduce pov poverty and promote the development of the countries concerned as set uh, out in uh, article um, two, uh, 208 of the Lisbon Treaty. Namely, the aim of development's hate is not to prevent migration or to prevent people from um, uh, moving between, between countries. About the mid five, uh, that said that the destination countries do not benefit from migration. So we frequently heard that um, immigration has enormous costs for, costs for uh, dev uh, developed uh, countries, that um, migrants are a, a, an economic burden for the countries where they settle due to, to the pressure they put on social protection systems and social services. Uh, particularly in times of crisis or lower economic growth. The reality says, says that about two thirds of all international um, migrants are part of the labor force and three in every four work, uh, works in every four works in the service sector. Although the, the socioeconomic impacts of migration is hard, uh, hardly measurable. Um, studies uh, point broadly to uh, beneficial impacts on the, uh, on, the, um, on the economies of destination or host countries uh, as regards the labor markets and economic growth in, in general. About the mid-7, that says that Europe cannot accept more migrants and refugees. Uh, so we frequently heard that Europe is being devastated by mass immigration that endanger its economic and political survival, as well as its social and cultural identity. At, uh, we heard that uh, at a time when the effects of the economic crisis are still evident, the European Union does not and should not absorb more immigrants or, or refugees. The reality. The European Union is an economic area with more than 500 million inhabitants. The wave of mig migrants and refugees over the last few years represent less than 1% of the uh, European population. 
this is a minimum percentage, percentage particularly if we consider uh, the, that some developing countries receive many more refugees and migrants. For example, Lebanon, Lebanon hosting around 1.2 million Syrian refugees with a population of 4.55 million. There's, that is one quarter of the, of the, the, the population. Um, uh, and uh, to finish, um, uh, what we know, uh, so this is the, the myths. Now I'm going just to show you, uh, show you what we know about uh, immigration in, uh, in Portugal. Uh, we have uh, 590,000 um, 348 non-national citizens residents in Portugal. This is numbers of um, uh, 2019. Um, the most representative nationalities that we have are from Brazil, uh, then Cabo Verde, Reino Unido, Romania, and so, uh, Ukraine, and, and others. Uh, just some examples about uh, refugee integration in, in Portugal. We have a, a, a story about refugees that helped Portuguese during the, the, the pandemic. And we have some examples of reception in, in, in Portugal. Um, say as as uh, good examples, uh, with the learning the, the Portuguese language, healthcare access, a uh, school for, for children and young people uh, in, the in, the, in the education system uh, and adults uh, integrated into the labor markets or in training programs. I just want to say something uh, to finish. Uh, so we, we use the, the words uh, integrated or, or inclusion. Maybe uh, we can pass to say and think in other words as a, a colleague of mine uh, told me in the other day, that is diversity. Uh, so we have to work for the importance of diversity, how to work and how to live um, this diversity, um, because this is more important than thinking just in integration or, or, or inclusion. Um, and to finish, uh, thank you, that's it. Uh, if you need uh, something or if you have some question, you can you can ask me. This is uh, our contacts, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Katya, and okay. thank you for all the uh, speakers today. Uh, I think we are running out of time, so therefore I will slightly but surely close the panel. Before closing the session, uh, I would like to ask all of you, if you can, to complete a very short evaluation survey about the organization and the content of the workshop, today's workshop, and I just posted in, in the chat. So I'll also send uh, via email. And upon the completion of the form, we will send you the certificates of attendance, which you might need for, for various reasons. Uh, within the form, very briefly, you are also requested to write a question uh, to be asked uh, a, a policymaker about the issues uh, covered during the, the workshop. And these questions will be asked to a policymaker, then the answers will be recorded for our next workshop. Uh, so this is the issue. And we will certainly send you also uh, the, the, the link for survey via email. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all the audience. Uh, I think it was quite interactive. And we hope to host you at our next workshop. Thanks a lot. <laughs>